Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about neonatal sepsis. So when we talk about neonatal sepsis, this is defined as a clinical syndrome with systemic signs and symptoms of infection in the first four weeks of life. Okay, so when we talk about neonatal, we are basically referring to the first four weeks of life or the first 28 days of life. Okay, and sepsis, that's basically the syndrome with systemic signs and symptoms of infection. Okay. So when we talk about neonatal sepsis, it refers to an infection involving the bloodstream in newborn infants less than 28 days old. Neonatal sepsis refers to an infection involving the bloodstream in newborn infants that are less than 28 days old. So when we talk about neonatal sepsis, it's defined into two groups, okay, based on the time of presentation after birth. Early onset sepsis and late onset sepsis, okay. So when we talk about early onset sepsis, this refers to sepsis in neonates at or before 72 hours of life. However, there is some variation in literature because others also say the first 7 days of life. Okay. However, even the ones that use first 7 days, they still agree that 95% of in fact usually presents within the first 72 hours of life okay and late onset sepsis is defined as sepsis occurring at or after 72 hours of life when we talk about the etiology basically we're talking about the caus causative agents okay so what causes sepsis so early onset sepsis is generally caused by the transmission of pathogens from the female genital urinary system to the newborn or the fetus so these pathogens, okay, they can ascend the vagina, the cervix, and the uterus, and they can also infect the amniotic fluid. Sometimes the neonates can also become infected in utero or during delivery as they pass through the vaginal canal or the birth canal, okay? Then the typical pathogens for early onset sepsis include GBS, group B streptococcus, E. coli, coagulase negative staphylococcus, Hemophilus influenza and Listeria monocytogens. Okay, then maternal factors that increase the risk of neonatal sepsis include chorioamnionitis. This is whereby the infection of the amniotic fluid. Okay, GBS colonization, which is colonization by Group B streptococcus. So when we talk about high income countries, or we can talk about first world countries, usually before birth they actually swab the mother for Group B streptococcus infestive. To check for group B streptococcus, okay. However, in low income settings, we don't usually do that. Delivery before 37 weeks and prolonged rupture of membranes greater than 18 hours. All these are risk factors for getting early onset neonatal sepsis. Then, late onset neonatal sepsis it usually occurs via the transmission of pathogens from the surrounding environment after delivery. So, what in what environment are we referring to? Contact from healthcare workers or caregivers. Then a percentage of late onset neonatal sepsis may also be caused by a late manifestation of vertically transmitted infections. So when we talk about vertically transmitted infections, we are talking about infections from the mother, okay? Infants requiring intravascular catheter insertion or other invasive procedures that disrupt the mucosa. These are at increased risk for developing late onset neonatal sepsis. So this is basically what I've already talked about as a summary. So common organisms that have been identified include, so if you can only remember three, these are the three you need to remember. E. coli, group B streptococcus, listeria monocytogens. Then these are the other organisms, okay? Then when we talk about the epidemiology, so the incidence of neonatal sepsis is one to eight cases per thousand live births. So you need to know this is a very important topic. And mortality is 13 to 17, 70% worldwide, which is quite high. Then in the sex, it commonly affects males more than females. And when we talk about age, it commonly affects premature infants more than term infants, okay? So when we talk about the pathogenesis, so neonatal infections are unique in several ways. Infectious agents can be transmitted from the mother to the fetus or the infant, okay, by diverse modes. Then we know that newborn infants are less capable of responding to infection because of one or more immunologic deficiencies. Basically what we're seeing is that the immune system is not well developed, right? So they're unable to fight the infections that they may get in the early neonatal period. 
Then three, coexisting conditions often complicate the diagnosis and management of neonatal infections. Then when we talk about the clinical manifestations of newborn infections, they vary, okay? And some can include subclinical infection, then mild to severe manifestations of focal or systemic infection, and really congenital syndromes that can result from in utero infection, the timing of exposure, inoculum size, immune status, maternal infection that is the source of transplacental fetal infection is often undiagnosed during pregnancy. Why? Because the mother was either asymptomatic or had no specific signs and symptoms Okay, at the time of acute infection. So we didn't really know exactly what caused the infection. So we didn't treat it. A wide variety of etiologic agents infect the newborn that can include bacteria, viruses, fungus, protozoa, and mycoplasmas. Then immature, very low birth weight newborns have improved survival but remain in the hospital for a long time in an environment that puts them at continuous risk for acquired infections. So when we talk about immature neonates or very low birth weight newborns, their survival has actually increased drastically over the years. However, they usually kept in hospital, okay? So when they are kept at the hospital for long periods of time, there is a higher risk of them acquiring infections, okay? Then classification, we briefly talked about it earlier, where we talked about early onset sepsis, which is infection from birth to 72 hours or other cesarean days. Infection is usually transplacental, ascending basically from the maternal vaginal tract going up or intrapitum. And it commonly manifests as a pneumonia, most common, and it can less commonly present as meningitis. And then when we talk about late onset sepsis, which are the 72 hours to 28 days, or other say 8 days to 28 days, this is usually either acquired in a hospital, home, or community. So how does late onset sepsis manifest? It can manifest as septicemia, too, it can manifest as hematogenous seeding, which may result in focal infections, such as meningitis, which is in 75% of cases. So when we talked about early onset sepsis, we said it commonly manifests as a pneumonia. However, late onset sepsis is usually going to manifest as meningitis in 75% of cases. Then third, it can manifest as osteomyelitis, arthritis, or even a urinary tract infection. So this is basically a brief summary of what we have already discussed, except the treatment. So when we talk about the treatment, we'll just talk about it separately, okay? So clinical features, manifestations of neonatal sepsis are usually vague and demand a high index of suspicion, okay? If you want to make an early diagnosis. So what are those manifestations? So there'll be an altered feeding behavior, okay? In a well-established feeding newborn. So what the mother will say was, from the time the child was born was feeding just fine. However, I've noticed for one or two days they haven't been feeding properly. So that may be a presentation of sepsis. Then two, respiratory distress. Remember we said that early onset neonatal sepsis commonly presents as a pneumonia. So they're going to notice that the patient isn't breathing well, okay? Then third, baby who was active suddenly or gradually becomes lethargic, inactive or unresponsive and refuses to circle. So the parents are going to say the patient was just active and all. However, we have noticed from yesterday, they are not active at all. They are not really reacting to stimuli, okay? Then for temperature instability, so hypo or hyperthermia, usually we're used to the fact that when we notice high temperatures, we're like, yeah, infection. However, neonatal sepsis, it can present as hypothermia, which is abnormally low temperatures, so hyperthermia, which is higher than usual temperatures, okay? Then on the skin, they can present with poor peripheral perfusion, cyanosis, pallor, petechia, rashes, or jaundice. Then metabolic, they can present with hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia or metabolic acidosis. So now when a patient or a neonate presents with these symptoms, okay, so you need to investigate, you need to know, is this sepsis or not? So there is no specific investigation, which include you can do a full blood count. There you're going to look at the white blood cell count and the differential count. When you notice neutropenia or the neutrophils are low, so that's one of, a threat, one of the threatening signs, okay? So when we talk about the value, less than 1,800, okay? Then we can check for acute phase reactants, so just CRP. It usually rises early, however, it's less reliable in, uh, in early onset neonatal sepsis. 
then ESR it can rise to above 15 millimeters in the first hour so these are investigations you can do then platelet counts you can go down it's a late sign and it's non-specific okay then other things you can check for is bilirubin glucose levels and sodium then definitive diagnosis can be made by cultures okay so a blood culture you're able to see the organism that will confirm the sepsis urine culture csf studies okay and this is useful in clinically ill newborns or those with positive blood cultures you can go for radiological investigation such as a chest x-ray when do we do this for infants that present with respiratory symptoms we can do a renal ultrasound scan this is for infants with accompanying UTIs, okay? You can do a cranial ultrasound scan or MRI CT scan. So when do you do that? This is for infants with probable meningitis or seizures. Otherwise, it's not recommended to do an MRI or CT scan, okay? So what is the differential diagnosis of neonatal sepsis? It could be respiratory distress syndrome, metabolic diseases, hematologic diseases, CNS diseases, and cardiac diseases, okay? So when you start treating them and then you notice there is no improvement, you need to start looking into other causes that may have a similar presentation. So when we talk about treatment, it's obviously there is a specific treatment which will be antibiotic therapy and supportive therapy. So antibiotic therapy ideally should be based on culture and sensitivity and they use to suppress bacterial growth allowing the infant's defense mechanisms time to respond. However, we'll discuss the antibiotics that we commonly use, okay? Then supportive therapy. So in addition, you can apply some supportive measures. What are those? Assisted ventilation, cardiovascular support, okay? So when we talk about antibiotics, we can begin with a combination of ampicillin or x and an aminoglycoside. We commonly use gentamicin. For 10 to 14 days and it's usually effective against most organisms that are responsible for early onset sepsis however if you notice the above drugs are not helping you can switch to second line which is a combination of cloxacillin and cefotaxim then if there's meningitis that is present so the treatment should be extended to 21 days or 14 days after a negative result from a csf culture Then when we talk about supportive therapies, if they have respiratory symptoms, you notice the oxygen saturation is going down, you can give them oxy oxygen and ventilation as necessary. Cardiovascular, if you notice they're not holding up, they're going into shock, into cardiogenic shock, you can support blood pressure with volume expanders. Hematology, you can treat the GIC. CNS, if they present with seizures, you need to treat the seizures. The drug of choice as the first line is phenobarbital. Then metabolic, if they present with hypoglycemia, you need to correct that, okay? So how do you prevent neonatal sepsis? Good antenatal care. So maternal infection should be diagnosed and treated early. Babies should be breastfed early and infection control policies need to be applied in the unit at the hospital, okay? So that's all about neonatal sepsis. If you like the video, please like, subscribe and comment. Thank you.